Hello everybody and welcome to the Constable. Please subscribe now to get the latest news on archaeology, ancient history, civilizations and world mythology. Without further ado, let's get started. In the year 196 BC, a collection of the more important priests of ancient Egypt assembled in the city of Memphis, the ancient and original capital of the land of Kemet, known to us as Egypt. The clergy of the day did well to take counsel because things were not well in the kingdom and they were the political backbone of the regime. Their ruler, King Ptolemy V Epiphanes, was a male child who had ascended the throne at the age of five and was crowned at the age of twelve. His parents have been murdered and usurpers governed the land in the new king's name, but the assassins were themselves murdered. Power was taken by the Greek Aristomenes of Alesia, a priest and the prime minister of the previous kings. The council of priests had much on their minds. Egypt's overseas territories were being seized by other Greek kings and so a weak ruler was not what the government needed. It was also problematic that the king and his ministers were largely Greek, not Egyptian. The Ptolemaic dynasty traced their bloodline only back to 304 BC when the first Ptolemy seized power in Egypt after the death of the great conqueror Alexandra the Great of Macedon. The Greek overlords were aware of how few they were among so many of the captive Egyptians and the first rebellions. The priests therefore wanted to secure the authority of the Greek regime and to show their loyalty and so in honor of the young king's coronation they composed a decree for him to issue. They were determined that the nation must be instructed on what a fine prince their 12-year-old pharaoh was. The decree was proclaimed in 196 BC. The text opens with a long list of flattering titles and honors for the king and then goes on to list the many great accomplishments of the young ruler. We are told that he won battles, forgave prisoners, paid his good troops, defeated evildoers, administered true justice, honors the gods, and they did not fail to mention many provisions he made for the priests. One does not have to be too cynical to say that this is a great deal of propaganda to attribute to a 12-year-old boy. The then commanded that a jewel statue of the young king be placed in every temple in the land. The decree reads in part, in every temple which is called by his name, and this statue shall rest in the most holy place in the temple, side by side with the shrine of the gods of the gnomes. And on the days of the great festival, when the god of the temple cometh forth from his holy habitations, according to his day, the holy shrine of the god who makes himself manifest, the lord of beauties, shall likewise be made to rise like a sun with them. And in order to make this new shrine to be easily distinguishable, both at the present day and in the future times, they shall set upon this shrine ten royal double crowns made of gold and upon each of the double crowns there shall be placed the serpent, which it is right and proper to make for the double crown of gold, instead of the two ure which are placed upon the tops of the shrine, and the second crown shall be in the middle of them because it was in the second crown in which his majesty shone in the house of the car of, of Pitar. The decree that both honored the king and ensured that the priest would keep their precious rights and powers was set up at the temple in the nearby sites. And its decree was given in three forms, the ancient hieroglyphic writing system, the then contemporary demotic scripts, and Greek. But time has no favorite, and a century later the land of Egypt and the Greek rulers would later fall into the grip of Julius Caesar and his heirs. Later still, the Islamic invasion would arrive and the Muslim had no time for pagan temples and false gods. The priestly decree was thrown down and eventually used as a building stone in the nearby city of Rashid. In the year 1798 AD, 
In an effort to deprive the British of access to the Middle East, the French general Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt and took control of the now Islamic states. As a military raid, this accomplished almost nothing, but it opened the door to Egypt from Europe. For the first time in over a thousand years, Europeans could visit Egypt, see its pyramids and temples, and look upon the mysterious inscription in a language that was utterly forgotten. Egyptian acts and pictures of the land became the cultural passion in the West, and Egyptian images filled art galleries and home decorations. The Americans even put a pyramid on the back of their dollar bill. The following year, two events occurred which will change the history of archaeology and our understanding of antiquity forever. First, a group of French soldiers digging a drainage ditch near the port city of Rashid came across the buried decree of old priest. On it were carved three registers of writings. The first two inscriptions could not be read, but the Greek could be translated. Unfortunately, the French officer class often had a classical education. Whoever was in command of the engineers correctly deduced that this was a trilingual test and as such offered the possibility of finding a way to translate the old hieroglyphics. Because Rashid was difficult to pronounce for the French infantry, they called the stone Rosetta, a traditional French female name. Napoleon had summoned over a hundred scholars to Egypt to take account of the antiquities, but the French would not have the stone for long. The other action of 1799 was the reaction of the British government of King George III to the Napoleon adventure in Egypt. Under the command of Lord Nelson, the Royal Navy destroys the French fleet in Abu Kaya Bay and took control of Egypt. The attempts of surrender were simple. The French would surrender Egypt to Britain and the archaeological discoveries would be given to the crown. George III dispatched a warship to Egypt to bring the already famous Rosata stone back to England, where it resides in the British Museum of London to this day. But the clever French were careful to take plaster casts of the stone to continue their research on the unusual and still mysterious words. Perhaps the guards were guiding them. If you have any questions or ideas to share with us, kindly drop it in comment section. Like and share this video with friends and family on social media. Remember to subscribe to this channel and enable notification so you will not miss any updates. Thank you for watching.